or even as myself, even as I myself. But every man hath his proper gift of God, one after this manner and another after that. I say therefore to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I. But if they cannot contain, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. And unto the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord. Let not the wife depart from her husband. But, and if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. And let not the husband put away his wife. But to the rest speak I, not the Lord. If any brother hath a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. And the woman which hath an husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. But if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases. But God hath called us to peace. For what knowest thou, O wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband? Or how knowest thou, O man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? But as God hath distributed to every man, as the Lord hath called every one, so let him walk, and so ordain I in all churches. Is any man called being, uncirc being circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. Is any, man, is any called in uncircumcision? Let him not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing, but the keeping of the commandments of God. Let every man abide in the same calling wherein he was called. Art thou called being a servant? Care not for it. But if thou mayest be made free, use it rather. For he that is called in the Lord being a servant is the Lord's freeman. Likewise also he that is called being free is Christ's servant. Ye are bought with a price. Be not ye the servants of men. Brethren, let every man wherein he is called therein abide with God. Now concerning virgins, I have no commandment of the Lord. Yet I give my judgment as one that hath obtained mercy of the Lord to be faithful. I suppose, therefore, that this is good for the present distress. I say that it is good for a man so to be. Art thou bound unto a wife? Seek not to be loosed. Art thou loosed from a wife? Seek not a wife. But and if thou marry, thou hast not sinned. And if a virgin marry, she hath not sinned. Nevertheless, such shall have trouble in the flesh, but I spare you. But this I say, brethren, the time is short. It remaineth that both they that have wives be as though they had none. And they that weep as though they wept not. And they that rejoice as though they rejoiced not. And they that buy as though they possessed not. And they that use this world as not abusing it. For the fashion of this world passeth away. But I would have you without carefulness. He that is unmarried careth for the things that belong to the Lord how he may please the Lord. But he that is married careth for the things that are of the world, how he may please his wife. There is a difference also between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman careth for the things of the Lord, that she may be holy, both in body and in spirit. But she that is married careth for the things of the world, how she may please her husband. And this I speak for your own profit. Not that I may cast a snare upon you, but for that which is comely, and that ye may attend upon the Lord without distraction. But if any man think that he behaveth himself uncomely toward his virgin, if she pass the flower of her age and need so require, let him do what he will. He sinneth not, let them marry. Nevertheless, he that standeth steadfast in his heart, having no necessity, but hath power over his own will, and hath so decreed in his heart that he will keep his virgin doeth well. So then he that giveth her in marriage doeth well, but he that giveth her not in marriage doeth better. The wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth. But if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will, only in the Lord. But she is happier if she so abide after my judgment. And I think also that I have the Spirit of God. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for your words. We thank you for preserving of them for us today. God, I pray that you would please open up the scripture to us tonight. Lord, help us to be grounded and founded in the truth. 
I pray that you would please just fill me with your spirit tonight. Lord, help me to preach this sermon the way that you would have me to do it. Help me to, to make the, the concepts easily understood, dear Lord. And I pray that you would please speak to our hearts and open up our minds and help us not to be distracted, dear Lord, but help us to be attentive and um, ready to learn. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so it's a pretty long chapter, uh, chapter 7 here, but there's a few main concepts that we're going to be dealing with tonight. And uh, the, the number one main theme of this chapter is dealing with uh, marriage and people who are virgins or unmarried and people who are married. And, and there's a lot of things that we go into. So the very first section, we're going to read the first few verses again, is the uh, physical relationship that a man and wife have. So let's start reading in verse number 1. The Bible reads, Now concerning the things whereof ye wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. So obviously, this, you know, the church of Corinth had written unto Paul, and they asked him some questions, right? They're new to the faith. They're asking Paul questions. Hey, what do we do in this situation or that situation? And he's saying, well, you know, you wrote unto me about this. And he says, you know what? It's good for a man not to touch a woman. He's like, you're not supposed to just be sleeping around and committing fornication you know, it's good not to even touch a woman. And honestly, this is one of the reasons, you know, we're going through our series now about being old-fashioned, right? About having old-fashioned values and how people might look funny at us or, or say things that, that um, you know, because we don't, we're not going to fit in with this world. But we have values that's, that looks at verses like this. We say, you know, it's good for a man not to touch a woman. And what he's referring to here, just the, the primary application was referring to is having the physical relationship outside of marriage. Because the next verse, he says, Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. That's what he's talking about. But in order to avoid fornication, in order to keep the spirit of what he's saying here, you know, a lot of people think that, uh, you know, we grow up in a society where it's not, it's not a weird thing for... Um, people who are dating to be affectionate towards each other and, you know, maybe holding hands and not just holding hands, but, put, you know, giving each other big hugs and then, you know, even kissing or making out, right? These are all things that the world's going to say these are all acceptable while you're dating. But I don't think they are, right? Now, the biggest problem, what we don't want to do, is give occasion to the flesh to sin. When you start getting heavily involved with somebody, you know, as, as you're dating and you start to, um, you know, touch each other more. He says here, it's good for a man not to touch a woman. And I think we could, st we could take this, you know, pretty literally when you're not married. It's a good idea not to be touching women. For the men, right? It's a good idea not to be doing that. Because what are you going to do? I mean, what happens when you start, the more, the more physical contact you have with someone, it, it builds up. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to build up in your heart and, and in your, your flesh, your desire to want to do more. Which usually the touching then leads to kissing. And then the kissing will lead to other things. Now you want to be able to keep yourself pure. And, and you know, the Bible says flee fornication. We just saw that last week. You know, we need to flee fornication. We need to be as far away from fornication as possible. And in order to keep virgin before you're married, you need to just get it in your mind and set it in your, in your heart that I'm not going to touch, you know, some of the opposite gender. I mean, obviously, you know, if you greet someone, you give them a hug, that's, that's one thing. But that's not what I'm referring to. And you all know what I'm talking about here when you start getting very affectionate towards someone while you're dating. Because it always leads to one thing. You know, anybody that commits fornication, I guarantee you they were, they were kissing and making out before that. I mean, it's very, it would be very odd for that not to happen that way. And why? Because it all builds up and it builds up upon each other. And not just that, you know, I think there's more provisions that we should be making to not indulge in the flesh. So as you're growing up and as you start to meet people and you start dating, you know, uh, especially for the younger people, be chaperoned, be in a place that's public. And even as an adult, when I finally got right with God before I was married and, I, and if I was going to date people, it would be a very, very public place. Not in, you know, and there's places you can go and have conversations and be alone. 
but still being out in public where there's no way anything inappropriate is going to happen because you're still out in public. And that's what I believe that people ought to be doing. Those are the values that we hold here and that we're going to promote in this church is for people, you know, like the Apostle Paul says, it's good for a man not to touch a woman. But nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife. He's saying, you know, if you, if you feel like, you know, you... You're having a hard time, you, you, you're not going to be able to control yourself, and you just really you want to, to have that act with somebody, then get married. Because then it's fine. You want to do that? Great. Go ahead and do it. You're not sinning if you get married. The problem comes in when you want to do that, but you don't want to get married to somebody. Then you're committing fornication just to fulfill the lusts of your flesh. He's saying, look, if, you're, if you want to do it that bad, if you want to have that type of relationship, then do it the right way and get married. <laughs> Verse number three, he says, Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. So this is a two-way street in marriage. The husbands and wife. Now, I went over quite a bit on the roles on Sunday night, the gender roles. You know, we're going over the roles of, of men and women in the 50s and, and the good, uh, positive attributes that they had for that. And we went through a lot of scripture. I'm not going to turn to all those tonight since we just did on Sunday night. I'm not going to just re-preach everything that I just re-preached on Sunday night. But we're taught that the you know, the, the man, the, the, the husband is the head of the household. He's the one who God has given the authority to in the family. He's the one that makes the decisions. He's the leader of the family. And the wife is to submit and be under obedience to her husband in all things. We saw that. Read Ephesians chapter 5. It's very clear about that. But in this situation, what we're talking about here is giving benevolence. What's that mean? It's a, it's a love. You're doing nice things for each other. You know, let, the, let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence. You know, treat your wife well. Do good things for her. Love her. And then also the same exact, the wife needs to do the same for the husband. Now look at verse number four. He says, the wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband. And likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. So here's, this is, and this is real interesting. I mean, because you think about this, when you have this relationship, he started off talking about to avoid fornication, get married. And now he's saying once you're married, your body does not belong to you. It belongs to the other person. And this is a big deal. And this, we, we really need to make sure that we understand this concept fully because it's important. It's going to be important for keeping marriages together. The desire to have a physical relationship can get very strong. It's, one of a, it's, an, it's, a, it's a desire that we have that is stronger than, than probably just about any of the other desires that we have. You know, people have a lot of desires to, um, you know, consume alcohol or do drugs or smoke cigarettes or do all of these other things, right? Besides like eating food, because eating food is another strong desire that we have. Why? Well, I mean, eating food is a strong desire because it's going to help us to live, right? I mean, if you just keep going, going, going without food, the desire, your body is going to be craving it more and more and more. Well, we also have this desire that that's this instinct that God has given us <coughs> to have a physical relationship with the opposite gender. And he says, the only way that you can be doing this that is acceptable in the eyes of God is to be married. And one of the reasons why that is, that is totally legitimate to get married is so that you avoid fornication. It's because, hey, I want to fulfill and satisfy this desire that I have that is not sinful, that won't be sinful if I get married. So once you get into that marriage, what he's saying is that, okay, now the other, if the other person basically wants to have that physical relationship, you should, you should not be denying that person because in that sense, your body doesn't belong to you. You shouldn't be saying, no, no, I don't want to do that now. If the other person wants it, then, then that is, I mean, this is what the Bible is teaching. He said, look, you don't have power over your own body but the husband. You don't have power of your own, own body, but the wife. So either way, you know, you have the, these common, you know, in the TV shows and the movies and stuff, you always see, you know, someone say, oh, I've got a headache and all this other stuff. The Bible's saying, no, that's not, you know, 
You need to be able to have this relationship with each other because what's going to happen is the desire is going to build up and the longer you go and you don't, you don't fulfill this, this relationship, you don't have a physical relationship with your spouse, it's going to be a lot more likely that one of you is going to be going off into sin and committing adultery, which is terrible, which nobody wants. Nobody wants that to happen, to destroy your marriage, to destroy your family, to split you up and whatever, and, you know, commit a sin that's worthy of the death penalty and betray the person, all because you're not being obedient to the Bible in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 4, saying that, look, you, don't, you really don't have the control of your body. It's, it's the, you know, the other person in the marriage. And this is the one, the one time that we see where the husband is not the boss, right? Because in all, in, in all matters, the, the husband is the one who's in charge. But in this matter, if the wife wants that relationship, the husband does not have the authority to just say no. Because if the wife wants that type of relationship together, then, then you need to be able to do that. And it's the same way to go in the opposite direction. And look what he says in verse 5. Defraud ye not one the other, Except it be with consent for a time that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. Now, in the first part of that verse, he says, defraud ye not one the other. I mean, think about the word defraud. It's like you're committing fraud against the other person. What is fraud? Fraud is when you, when you say one thing and you, you know, you basically you're doing another thing, right? You're committing fraud. You're, um, you're gaining somebody's confidence you know, fraud would be like a bait and switch, right? That's committing fraud. The reason why it's fraud in a marriage is because, hey, you know, we're married, I can avoid fornication, and now you're withholding this from me. This is something that you're not supposed to have that power over your body. You know, I have that to, to be able to do that. And when you withhold that from your spouse, he's saying, look, you're, you're committing fraud against your spouse. So don't defraud you on the other, except it be with consent for a time. Now, we live in a world where, again, having a, a, a physical relationship between two people is, you're saying, well, it always has to be consensual. It always has to be consensual. But is that what the Bible's teaching here? Between a husband and wife? It's not. The consent part comes in when you both decide we're not going to do this. So really, you know, if one person wants to do it and the other person doesn't want to have that relationship... The person that wants to is, 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 is right to be able to do that. Now, look, <laughs> I don't think it's good or healthy to just to force people. I don't believe that. But biblically speaking, you have the, the right, right? It's not, it's not that the Bible is not teaching that you both have to consent. If, but if you get to the point where you feel like you have to force your spouse into doing something, you've got a big problem in your marriage. Because that's not right either. I mean, it shouldn't get to the point where like, you're just, you just have to force the other person, husband or wife. That's not a healthy relationship. You ought to, to be able to have that, that closeness, and you need to really examine why that is. Okay, but the Bible's not teaching here that it just always has to be consensual every time that you have that relationship. He says here that the consent comes when you both decide not to do it. So you're both abstaining from the physical relationship. That is from consent. And it makes sense to be consent because you have to get basically the permission of the other person to withhold yourself since they're the ones in control of your body. Say, hey... Why don't we not do this? Because, and, and here's the reason why. And it's not just for every reason. He says that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer. Because when you fast, you know, prayer and fasting are, are tied together like all the time in the Bible. You're always, you're always praying to God and, and, and praying over whatever you need while you're, you're doing a fast. But in the fast, what that is, is you're withholding things from yourself. Usually it's food. But it, 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 this is going in the spirit of the fast is you're withholding all pleasure and all fleshly desires from yourself. You're humbling yourself. And I have an entire pre, uh, sermon I preach about fasting. But this is a reason and it's a legitimate reason to say, hey, I'm doing a fast unto the Lord. I'm praying. You know, I, I'm really trying to um, afflict my soul with this fast. 
So it makes sense to withhold the pleasure that you have with the physical relationship, but that needs to be consensual. Just say, hey, you know, this is what I want to do, so let's, let's agree, you know, not to, not to have this relationship for a couple of days. And think about that. How long do you often fast for? I don't normally fast for longer than a day. When I do a fast, that's tip, a typical fast for me is a day. Some people do a day, two days, three days, right? I mean, a few days. I mean, if you got something really serious, maybe a week. But that's a really long time. I don't know a lot of people that fast for that long. I mean, that really is a long time. Um, it's very, very seldom that, that you hear people fasting for that long. It just doesn't happen very often. And, um, but I mean, when you think about it, you have a limit on how many days you can go without eating. And that's the, the reason he's given for not having that relationship. So he said, that's the reason why you don't do this. So then when you're done with your fast, then you come together again and he's saying, pick right back up and have that relationship. Why? That Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. Now, the word incontinency is basically means your inability to contain yourself. You are not able to contain the desire that you have. And basically, Satan would be tempting you to commit adultery. So he's saying when you don't have that relationship, when you defraud each other, when you are, are keeping yourselves apart from each other, not having the relationship that a husband and wife have, then Satan's going to be able to tempt you. And it's going to be a much stronger urge and it's going to be a much more drawing temptation for him to get you and to snare you when you haven't had a relationship for a long time with your spouse. And that's just the way it is. I mean, that's, that's the way that, that we work. Now, some people are very, um, are not quite as affected by this than others, but we're going to get into that. The Apostle Paul brings that up, and he talks about that being a gift that people have to keep their virgin like the Apostle Paul did. He kept his virgin for his life. I, I mean, I assume. That's what, that's, I don't know his personal life, but the way that it reads and, the way, and all the evidence that we have is that we know that he wasn't married. So I would just be under the assumption, since he said he kept the, the law you know, as a Pharisee, blameless, and then also he's saying that people would be like him, that he kept his virgin. But, um, but that is not something that everybody is even capable of doing. And he explained it. We we're going to see this all throughout the chapter. A lot of, a lot of false doctrine is going to come out of 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And we're going to deal with that tonight. A lot of people will turn to this chapter to try to make an excuse for getting a divorce or try to explain why, see, everybody in the world should be single and that, you know, you shouldn't be getting married and all this other stuff. It's nonsense. It's nonsense. I was just having a discussion with someone a, a, a couple weeks ago that was saying that, you know, well, doesn't the Bible say it's, you know, you're basically doing that of the world when you please your wife, you know, like, so it's just better not to even have a wife at all. And I'm going to deal with that too. But let's keep reading here. Verse number six. Now he says, so, so all these things, verse number one through five, you know, these are all good, solid teachings. He's preaching the word of God. Verse number six, but I speak this by permission and not of commandment. And he's referring to the verses that he's going to speak after that. He's saying, but okay, but now... I'm speaking unto you by permission. He has permission of God, you know, to be able to speak these things, but not of commandment. This is not a command that they have to follow. Verse 7, For I would that all men were even as I myself. So here's where he's saying, look, I would, he's saying, it's, it's my will, I would like it if all men were even like me. But every man hath his proper gift of God, one after this manner and another after that. He realizes and recognizes, look, not everybody has that same gift that he does to where this isn't a really big problem in his life to where the Apostle Paul is just thinking, man, I got to get married because if I don't, I'm going to commit fornication. But there are a lot of people out there. I think Paul is more the exception to the rule, which again, that makes sense too. Why would God give everyone that gift? I mean, how in the world then is, is the whole world going to continue and people are going to continue to populate and be fruitful and multiply the earth? If everybody just was going to be an Apostle Paul and everybody kept a virgin and nobody got married? 
How are kids going to be born, right? And it's an insight that God has given to us. So not everyone has that gift to where it's not a problem at all. I know I don't have that gift. And most people I know don't. Because it's a strong urge, it's a strong desire. But, and this is why he says, look, this isn't of commandment. He has permission. He has the Holy Ghost. He's, he's preaching and he still is speaking God's word. But he's saying, this is not a commandment. He's making very clear about that. And he says, I say therefore to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I. And now here's where we can look at this verse and say, well, how did Paul abide? He abided by serving the Lord, you know, preaching the gospel, keeping his virgin, and just doing all the things that are right with his life. So, Saying, is it good for people who are widowed or unmarried to abide as him? Of course that's good. There's no contradiction. There's nothing wrong with what he said. It's absolutely a good thing. Hey, I would that every unmarried and widow would abide like Paul did. That would, that would be able to serve God with their whole heart and be able to, to live for God with their life. Amen. But... It's better, but he says here, look at verse number nine. But if they cannot contain, let them marry. So he's saying, look, I wish everybody that's unmarried can live like me. And then, well, if they can't contain, let them marry. For it is better to marry than to burn. Now that word where he says to burn there, he's not referring to like burning in hell. Okay? He says it's better to marry than to burn. Burning would be like, you know, burning in your lust for somebody. Because think about this, it's a sin. Jesus Christ himself said, you know, that um, but if a man look on a, wo a woman and lust after her in her heart, he's committed adultery with her in his heart already. And I know I'm paraphrasing this, so I apologize for not quoting that verse perfect. But he, um, you know, when, when a man looks on a woman and lu has lust in his heart and he's burning in his lust after a woman, you've already committed adultery in your heart with that person, which is a sin. So he's saying here, look, you don't even want that to happen. And so if you can't contain, then just get married. That's fine. You know, there's nothing wrong. There's just definitely nothing sinful to get married. God created Adam, and then he created a help meet for him in Eve out of his rib, and that he may have a wife. And, that's, and it says, for this cause shall man leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife. It's a good thing to get married and have children. There's nothing wrong or sinful or bad about that. And he's definitely, he's saying it's definitely better to marry than to, than to burn. Verse number 10. And unto the married, I command, yet not I, but the Lord. So now he's shifting gears again. He's saying, okay, first, we said, you know, the unmarried, the widows. Hey, you know what? It's good. Just live your life and, and do what I'm doing. Serve God with all of your heart and just, and just live your life like that. But, you know, if you need to get married because, because you just feel like you need to, then go ahead and get married. Right? That was, that was what Paul spake by permission. But now he's making it clear, you know what? Here's what I command. He's like, well, you know what? No, not what I command. This is what God commands. Let not the wife depart from her husband. This is to a married couple. Wife, don't leave your husband. God hates divorce. God doesn't want you to get divorced. But look what he says, but and if she depart. So because he's adding something here, does that mean, oh, it's okay if, if a person gets divorced? No. God still says, look, I'm telling you not to get divorced. This is why I say, what God hath joined together, let not man divide asunder. That is the way that God intended marriage. That is the way he wants it. So unto the married, God says, don't get a divorce. But God knows that people are sinners. God knows that it's going to happen. So he adds further to that saying, okay, I do not want you to get divorced. This is against God's will for you to get a divorce. But if you do, if it does happen, then this is what you need to follow. And he says, but and if she depart, let her remain unmarried. Say, fine, if you get divorced, it's a sin. I don't want you to get divorced, but then don't get married. Or 
be reconciled to your husband. So you either remain unmarried or you could go back and, and patch things up with your husband and then get, re get married back to him and let not the husband put away his wife. And he just adds that there, so it's, you know, it's both directions. God does not want the husband getting divorced from his wife or the wife getting divorced from her husband. That's not what he wants. And um, you know, notice how much weight he's giving to his statements here. You know, he makes it perfectly clear what God's commandment is concerning marriage and divorce versus his opinion. And people love to take 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and just kind of prop up the opinion of the Apostle Paul above the commandment of God. Because this is a place that people will turn to, we'll get to that in just a second, that, that want to get divorced. Because we'll get into this in just a minute, why people will try to twist things and use it to justify divorce in their marriage. But I'm going to read for you from Matthew 19. I read this on Sunday night, but it's worth looking at again. In Matthew 19, we're going to see Jesus, and it's when the Pharisees were questioning him and saying, you know, is it lawful for a man to get divorced for any cause? You know, is it just, can we just get divorced for any reason? In Matthew 19, 4, Jesus uh, answered them and said unto them, uh, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore they are no more twain but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let no, not man put asunder. That lines up exactly with what we see here in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 saying, Don't get divorced. And if you do get divorced, you're supposed to just remain unmarried and go back to your original spouse. Let's keep reading here in verse number um, 12. So again, that was the commandment of God. Look at verse number 12. But to the rest speak I, not the Lord. So is this a commandment of the Lord or is this Paul's opinion that we're reading now? This is Paul's opinion. He said, look, and, and it, you notice how he makes this clear. He said, look, to the married command I. No, not me, but the Lord. The Lord commands this to the married. Don't get divorced. But to the rest speak I, not the Lord. If any brother hath a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. So again, nothing contradictory unto what God's commandment is. He's saying, look, if, you have an un if you're married to an unbeliever, because this can be an issue in people's marriage, much more than to believers. At least with another believer, you know, they should be giving respect unto God's word that says not to get divorced. But when you're married to someone who's an unbeliever, they're an unbeliever. Why would they give credence or respect unto God's commandment not to get a divorce, right? So here's the situation that we're looking at. And this is a real situation. And it could be more difficult because you have someone who's not saved and is not going to respect God's commandment to not get a divorce. But he says, if any brother hath a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put away. And he's still saying, don't get a divorce. And the woman which hath an husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. Okay, don't get divorced from your unbelieving spouse. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife. And the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. I mean, think about that. Like, you know, you, you shouldn't just get divorced because your spouse is an unbeliever. Now, you shouldn't get married to begin with if you know that the person you're interested in is an unbeliever. That's why the Bible says, be not unequally yoked with unbelievers. And there's not a bigger yoke than getting married to somebody because you're vowing to stay together forever. So once you do that, though, once you're, you're married, and, you know, sometimes people are both unsaved, unbelievers, and then one of them gets saved later on in their life. And you say, well, now what do I do? You know, I'm a believer, my husband's not. Or I'm a believer, my wife's not. It's a real situation. It happens. But he's saying here, look, remain married. And he's saying, look, you've got children. You know, let your children grow up in a family with the mother and father. And, and the person who's saved then, you, could st you still teach your children. And you'll be able to sanctify them. Verse 15, he says, and this, and this is like the big verse of where everyone wants to turn to in order to get their divorce, right? But if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. 
A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God hath called us to peace. Now, this is not just giving the green light for divorce. The word of the Lord still stands that God hates divorce. God does not want you departing from your wife or from your husband. And look at the case that he's specifically bringing up is if the unbeliever is leaving you. In no case is he saying for you to leave your spouse ever. So as a Christian, regardless of the status of the salvation of your spouse, you are not to leave your spouse. And for you, that's what you need to know. But what he's saying here is that, look, if they're leaving, you know, you have all these problems and you know what? That, that could very well happen with an unbeliever when you have a believer who starts to live for God and they start having all these different problems and all these fights arise and, you know, and you're trying to serve God regardless of the role that you're in and your spouse hates it. Maybe they've rejected the gospel. They will have nothing to do with it and they can't stand that you have taken, you, that you have believed, right? And that this is causing nothing but problems all of the time. So he's saying, if the unbelieving depart, then just let them depart. You're not the one trying to get a divorce from them. But if they're just, just you know, had it and they can't deal with it and they're, you know, they're trying to get a divorce, right? He says, let them depart. Whereas I would think, you know, in a, in a, marriage where you know you're both believers you should be fighting as much as possible to keep your marriage together and this is one instance where and i still think you should be one you know trying to keep your your marriage together as much as possible we're saying with some people with some unbelievers it's going to be a point to where like they're you know they're not going to get it when they're bent on just getting a divorce then just you know, fine. But when he says that, when he says that, uh, you know, a brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, he's not referring to the fact that if you get divorced, that you're not supposed to get remarried. Because that's another thing people want to do is say, oh, well, they divorced me and they were unbeliever, so now I can just go and get remarried. That's not what he's talking about. He says, the brother and sister is not under bondage in such cases. Why? Because God hath called us to peace. And the peace is letting them depart. Allowing them to go. It's not the bondage of, well, you were married and now you're divorced. Because even Jesus said, you know, that um, if you're divorced and you marry someone else, you're committing adultery. And he that marrieth her that is put away committeth adultery. With no caveats in it. Not saying unless it's the case where an unbeliever left and that's why the person's divorced, then it's okay to marry someone who's, who's divorced. That's not what it says. That's not what the Bible teaches. And there's evidence all throughout the Bible, especially in the New Testament about this. So you can't turn to one verse like this where Paul's saying that this is what I'm speaking, not the Lord. And just say, see, look, it's okay for me to get divorced. No. You should never be seeking a divorce as a Christian, as a believer. And if you are divorced... You should not be seeking a husband unless you're going back to be reconciled to your, you know, a husband or wife going back to be reconciled to your former spouse. And that's only good unless they, your, if your ex gets married, you can never reconcile with them again. Even if they get divorced again, it's done. You can't do it. But look at verse number 16. So even in the midst of the Apostle Paul saying this, you know, brother says, you know, if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. For what knowest thou, O wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband? Or how knowest thou, O man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? Another reason not to get divorced. Even with an unbeliever, right? He's saying, look, you don't know. You might get your husband saved. You might get your wife saved. Don't just leave them because they're an unbeliever. Don't leave them because they're an unbeliever and they still drink and go to the movies and do all this other stuff that you don't like anymore because 
now you're saved and you're trying to live for God. He's saying, no, stay together. And it just made me think of, uh, I think it's 1 Peter chapter 3. Yeah, in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse number 1, the Bible reads, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. So he's talking about here, you know, hey wives, just be in subjection to your husbands. And if your husband's an unbeliever, they can see the way that you're acting. They can see the way that you're speaking. They can see all of these things. And hey, maybe you'll win them over. They'll see your humility. They'll see your subjection unto them. They'll see the godly way in which you speak, your, your chaste conversation coupled with fear, the way that you present yourself where it's not all about you. You're dressing in modest apparel. And he talks about the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. And then he goes into um, describing Sarah and how Sarah obeyed Abraham. You don't know. You might be able to get them saved. So don't be looking for a divorce. It basically, the bottom line is, of all the verses that we read, the consistent thing is, don't get a divorce. The only thing that comes up that would be, and it's not contrary to that, but the only situation you're saying, well, if an unbelieving spouse is, de is just going to depart from you, then, then let them depart, not you go out and get a divorce. He never, a, a believer is never told to get a divorce here. Let's keep reading here now in verse number 15. Now, you're going to notice a shift here. The main theme, he's talking about the relationship with the husband and wife and virgins and not virgins, all this other stuff. But right smack dab in the middle, it's going to seem that this is kind of very unrelated, but it's not. And I'll explain in just a minute why this is not unrelated, but very significant to the whole concept of what we're talking about. Because it's one main theme that we're going over tonight. Look at verse number 17. He says, But as God hath distributed to every man, as the Lord hath called everyone, so let him walk, and so ordain I in all churches. Is any man called being circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. Is any called in uncircumcision? Let him not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing but the keeping of the commandments of God. Let every man abide in the same calling wherein he's called. So people get saved at different points in their life, right? He said, when you're called, when you, when you put your faith on Jesus Christ, when you get saved, hey, if you're uncircumcised, don't worry about it. However you were when you got called, you don't need to get circumcised now. And he's explaining in the New Testament, you know, circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing. Especially at this time, you know, the Jews really were, were holding tight to the, to the fact of, of circumcision and they were relying on the, 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 the law, basically. And that seal of the circumcision. And, and some people were teaching that you had, to even, you had to be circumcised in order to be saved. Which is weird because what about the women? I guess they couldn't get saved then, right? <laughs> because circumcision only works on a male. Unless they have some weird butchering thing. I know in some Eastern countries they do some bizarre thing, but that's not, that is just very strange. But um, he's saying, look, you don't have to worry about however you're called, then just abide in the same calling wherein he's called. And part of the reason here, now he's, he's leading into this because he was just talking about the unbeliever, you know, the, 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 the wife or the husband that has an unbelieving wife or husband as a spouse. Hey, however you're called, just, just serve God that way. You don't have to worry about it. You don't have to go and get divorced now because you're saved and your husband's not, right? The calling that you're called in, that's just abide that way. You got saved and, you're, and your spouse is unsaved. Hey, just stay married. Stay married and, and just serve God. I mean, it's, that's why he's bringing this up. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 21. Art thou called being a servant? So now he's not talking about circumcision anymore. He's talking about other things. Art thou called being a servant? Care not for it. But if thou mayest be made free, use it rather. For he that is called in the Lord being a servant is the Lord's freeman. 
Likewise, also he that is called being free is Christ's servant. Ye are bought with a price. Be not ye the servants of men. Brethren, let every man wherein he is called therein abide with God. And he's basically saying, look, wherever you're at in your life, be content with it. You don't have to worry about it. If you're circumcised, you, you, you know, don't worry about, oh, I'm circumcised and you know, I have to keep the whole lot. Look, that's nothing. Or if you're uncircumcised, don't think, oh, I got to get circumcised now. And he's saying, oh, if you're a servant, hey, don't worry about that because you're Christ's freeman. Just, you can continue being a servant and serve God. He's saying, or oh, if you're free. Well, guess what? If you're free, if you're not serving someone else, if you're you know, providing for your own, you're not under bondage to any other man, guess what? You're under bondage to Christ. You're Christ's servant. You don't need to regard that in your life, whether or not you're a servant or a free man. Hey, it doesn't matter. The servant should be doing the same thing that the freeman should be doing for Christ. Amen. He's saying just be content where you're at in your life. Don't worry about it. Now he's going to shift gears again. Look at verse number 25. Now concerning virgins, I have no commandment of the Lord, yet I give my judgment as one that hath obtained mercy of the Lord to be faithful. Again, now he's clearly saying this is not God's commandment. But uh, as we're reading this, I'll have you know, this is Scripture. And this is under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost that he's saying these things. But he's, he's giving the proper weight or authority behind the words, even, you know, because this, this is Scripture. And he does have the Spirit of God. Okay. So we don't just ignore what he's saying here because it's in the Bible. And it's still good and proper teaching. And just understand that there is no contradiction in what he's saying. Okay? But what people want to do is to take what he's saying and contradict God's commandment by elevating the, the status, of, you know, the, the authority of what he's saying to be backwards from what God said as a commandment. If that makes sense. Verse number 26. I suppose, therefore, that it is good for the present distress, I say, that it is good for a man so to be. Talking about being a virgin. Art thou bound unto a wife? Seek not to be loosed. Art thou loosed from a wife? Seek not a wife. But, and if thou marry, thou hast not sinned. And if a virgin marry, she hath not sinned. Nevertheless, such shall have trouble in the flesh. But I spare you. So now, again, he's, he's bringing up this, you know, hey, do you have a wife? Don't get divorced. You know, do you not have a wife? Don't seek a wife. He's saying, and, and basically this follows with, this, with what he, we were just reading about, you know, being a servant, being a free man, you know, whatever, whatever situation you find yourself in, be content where you're at and serve God that way. I mean, this is the main point. And that's why those verses about circumcision and being a servant and the Lord's free men and stuff, it's not in there by accident. It's in there because he's teaching us, you know, hey, whether you're married to an unbeliever or not, whether you're not married or you are married, whatever situation you're in, be content with that, be happy with that, and serve God in that condition, whatever it is. Don't lose focus on what is truly important with serving God. Verse 29, But this I say, brethren, the time is short. It remaineth that both they that have wives be as though they had none, and they that weep as though they wept not, and they that rejoice as though they rejoiced not, and they that buy as though they possess not. And they that use this world is not abusing it, for the fashion of this world passeth away. But I would have you without carefulness. He that is unmarried careth for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But he that is married careth for the things that are of the world, how he may please his wife. There is difference also between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman careth for the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and in spirit. But she that is married careth for the things of the world, how she may please her husband. And this I speak for your own profit, not that I may cast a snare upon you, but for that which is comely, and that you may attend upon the Lord without distraction. Now, the first thing I want to point out here is in verse 34, it, notice how it uses the word virgin and unmarried synonymously. He says, there's a difference between a wife and a virgin. Then he goes, the unmarried... Referring to the virgin. 
Why? Because God expects and demands that if you are not married, that you should be a virgin. And that the only way you should not be a virgin is to be married. As it starts off in the beginning of this chapter. But when he's referring to the unmarried, he's just assuming that they're a virgin. Because that is the standard. And that is what God demands. But... What I think we're going to see here with Paul, see, Paul's in a specific uh, position himself, and he says, I have no commandment of the Lord, there in verse 25, yet I give my judgment. And what, he's getting this judgment from his point of view as someone who's unmarried, right? Now, a lot of people in this, in this life, you know, uh, and I know some people that are getting older, and they're not married, and they really want to be married, and they're not. And it kind of wears on people and people could get discouraged or down because they haven't found a spouse, right? Now, a lot of what Paul's saying here is comforting to that person because Paul's able to provide a perspective from somebody who's not married. He's saying, look, there's some good things here. And he starts off, or he says, not starts off, but just basically in verse 29, he's saying, look, the time's short. You know, the time that we have on this earth, it's short. That both they that have wives be as though they had none. You know, I mean, you're not going to be married in the resurrection anyways. You're not going to have a wife or a husband. You have that wife or husband for the short time that we live here. And, he, and he's going on about, you know, people that buy as though they possess not. Hey, all the things in this world, it's all going to be burned up anyway. It's all going to be gone. So don't focus so much, even if you don't have a spouse, on not having that spouse. It would be the same thing as focusing too much on not having a bunch of money or not having other material possessions or things that you have, you know, because this world is just going to be burned up. He says, for the fashion of this world passeth away. It's all going to be gone. Don't let that bother you. This is supposed to be an encouragement to say, hey, don't worry about it. And then he goes on to say, look, he that's unmarried careth for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please the Lord. Say it's a good thing. It's fine. Hey, it's a good thing if you're unmarried because now you can just devote all of your time to serving God and use that time wisely. Don't sorrow and stress and fret over not having a spouse. Serve God. You have a special opportunity to serve God completely with your time. Use it for that. And he's not saying not yet that you can't get married or something. He's just saying, look, when you're unmarried, you're unhinged. You could do more things. The reason why the Apostle Paul was able to just travel all over the place and just preach the gospel everywhere is because he didn't have a wife and family. He didn't have any other obligations to keep him back to, in order to support his wife and to do all these other things. He was able to just go off and do his job and just serve the Lord. And that's why it says here, but the, you know, he, that is he that is married careth for the things that are of the world, how he may please his wife. And you know what? This isn't a bad thing. This is a good thing. Now, normally, you, know, you hear about worldliness and you know, he that is a friend of the world is an enemy with God. And amen and amen to that. But that's not like, you know, the way that that is sinful to be of the world and be like the world is not the way that he's talking about it here. It's not, it's not like it's a bad thing to please your wife. Because it's a good thing. God wants us to render due benevolence unto our spouse. It is a good thing. That is a command of God, if you're married, to do those things. But he's pointing out here, they're saying, look, a husband or a wife is going by necessity to be spending time doing things for their spouse other than serving God. Because they're married. But you, if you're single... You don't have to worry about that. You don't have to, you know, do things to, to plead that are going to be pleasing to your wife because you don't have a wife. You can just be focused completely on serving God. And again, this isn't to say that marriage is bad at all. And in no context, and in no way, is the Apostle Paul ever even implying that it's a bad thing to be married. But, you know, God said it's not good for the man to be alone. Okay, so it's a good thing to have marriage. That's why he, again, he created Eve and all this stuff. And we have all these, uh, these commandments about marriage and how God designed it. And how even in order to pastor a church, you need to be the husband of one wife. 
Think about that. Think about a pastor, hey, an elder, a bishop, someone who's serving God with their life, right? You can't even do that unless you're married. So it's not that getting married is a bad thing. He's trying to illustrate and just point out that, look, wherever you're at, if you're unmarried, great. Keep your virgin and serve God because you have extra time to do so. And I, I try to instruct people with this too because, you know, I got, I got, right, I got saved quite a while ago, but I got right with God before, before I got married. And I started to use all that, all my free time that used to be spent just in vanity, you know, when I was just completely living in the world. I started using that to do good things for God. Hey, I would go soul winning for hours. I remember in the early days of Faithful Word, I'd be able to help Pastor Anderson with anything that he needed almost all the time. But I mean, other than when I was working, because I was working a lot too. But all of my Saturdays, my Sundays, you know, days, uh, any other time, I was pretty, pretty wide open to serve God and to do whatever it was. And I was down for, for putting in all kinds of hours. Why? Because I didn't have any other obligations. And then I got married. And you know what? Some of that had to slow down because now I've got a wife. But before we had children, and, and I stress this too, if you don't have any children, you're married, use that time together to serve God. Because as you start having children, now, all of a sudden, it, it's going to be come to the point to where it's like, with us, we have four children. My wife and I don't go out soul winning together anymore unless maybe like one of our parents are in town and they're watching the children and we can both go out together. But when it gets to the point to where we're at now, it's just too much to bring to one person's house. You know, it's bringing an entire household to someone else's house. And um, we don't get to do that very often. So there's things that you do that, that kind of change uh, your ability to serve God and how you do that. So if you're, if you're married without children, hey, it's a good thing to be able to go out together because those are going to be times that you wish you had later once you start having more children. But, um, you know, and basically wherever you're at, you know, because people get caught up about, about not having children. People love, and I understand that. Look, when I got married, I wanted to have children right away. I loved it. And we had to wait a little while, not too long. But you want to have that child, but we need to just remain content with where you're at and use that to, to, the, to the fullest to serve God. Because the bigger your family, the more of these other, you could call them, of the world, you know, things of the world that you need to be able to take care of. I need to be able to work enough to support my children and my wife and everything else. You know, so, so that might cause me to work extra hours in order to do so, in order to be a good father to, to, to take care for my children. But, um, you know, depending on whatever situation you're in, you know, attend upon the Lord. And I think that's the point that he's trying to get across here. He's saying, hey, it's great. You're, you're not married. Great. You could serve the Lord without distraction now. You can just 100% serve God. And if along the way you find that, you know what, I can't contain, you know, I, need to get, I need to get married, get married. It's not a sin. And people have a tendency to look at this kind of script and be like, well, wait a minute, you're doing less for God. Isn't that a sin? No. If you get married, that's not a sin. Now, if you just blow off serving God and just to, to do vain things and you just don't do the things that God's laid out for you to do with your life, yeah, okay, that's a sin. But getting married is not a sin. I mean, he specifically says that it's not. And I, I, I'm kind of, kind of beating a dead horse with that one, but that point should be so clear. It's just people, and I've heard this too many times, will, will turn to these scriptures and, and turn them on their head. It turns the whole doctrine and understanding on its head. When the reading's pretty clear. It's, it's pretty reasonable. It's, it's, it's the people who want to rip verses out of context and just say, see, look, here, I could get divorced because of this. I'm not under bondage. No, why don't you read all the verses in the whole Bible about marriage and divorce and then just get the proper context of, of what he's saying here. Well, let's keep reading here. We're almost done. Verse number 36, But if any man think that he behaveth himself uncomely toward his virgin, if she pass the flower of her age and need so require, let him do what he will, he sinneth not. Again, just clear out. He sinneth not, let them, get, let them marry. Saying, look, and he says, If a man think that he behaveth himself uncomely toward his virgin, right? He's not basically saying, 
I'm not going to be able to keep my virgin. So I'm thinking I'm going to behave uncomely, like I'm, I'm going to lose my virginity here. If, if you think that's going to happen, he's saying, okay, you know, let him do what he will. He sins not, you know, he sinneth not by getting married. Let them marry. Go ahead and get married then. Nevertheless, he that standeth steadfast in his heart, having no necessity, but hath power over his own will, and hath so decreed in his heart that he will keep his virgin, doeth well. You're saying, but someone who doesn't have that problem, someone that has the willpower, someone that, uh, ha you know, it says having no necessity, right? So it hasn't gotten to the point where he's just like, man, I need to get a wife, right? Having no necessity, power over his own will, and has so decreed in his heart, he's already disturbed. You know what? I'm going to stay a virgin. Good. There's nothing wrong with that. That's good. Verse 38. So then he that giveth her in marriage doeth well, but he that giveth her not in marriage doeth better. The wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth. But if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will, only in the Lord. Now, another reason why the bondage that he's referring to earlier about the unbelieving, about the unbeliever departing, that would contradict this verse if he's talking about that bondage of, of you know, being divorced. Right? He's saying, look, because here the wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth. If you are divorced, as long as your husband's still alive, your ex-husband, as you call it, right? Here he says your husband. But if her husband be dead, once your husband dies, once your ex-spouse or your spouse dies, then you're at liberty to be married to whoever you want, only in the Lord, to another believer, someone else who's a believer. That's what it says, only in the Lord. Someone else who's in Christ. That's who you get married to. And it's a lot of options. I mean, people who are saved, just don't get married to an unbeliever. And it's up to you. And I, you know, notice here, it's, it's referring to she. It's referring to a wife, a, wo a woman. A lot of people say, oh man, the Bible says, you know, the women can't do anything. And they, they, they think that marriage is like all these arranged marriages and that the women's just, because, because of the gender roles that we do believe, that the, the husband's the head of the household and that his word is, is the word that stands, you know, and, and these other things. They just think that, that, you know, the Bible teaches you need to have, you know, it's people are ignorant of the Bible, but they'll think that, you know, women just don't have a voice and that they just get involved with these arranged marriages and stuff. Now look, it's true that the Bible says that the father, so like with my, I have three daughters, with my daughters, as long as they're in my household, I have the authority to disallow any vow that they make. If they make a vow unto God, if they make a promise, I can say no. I have that authority as the father and while they're living in my household. If I hear, they, they can, and you can say, no, it's between them and God. No, it's not. If I hear something and I disapprove of it, I can say no. And this goes back, I preach an entire sermon about this too, it's really interesting. This is why in the olden days, people, met, men or boys used to go and ask the permission of the father to marry the daughter. I would like to marry your daughter. Why? Because he had the authority to say no. So if you don't go and get his permission, you're not going to be able to marry his daughter. And that's the way it is with me and with my daughters. Any, any, any boy that's coming up in the future, you know, when they get to that age to where they're old enough to get married, anyone that's going to want to marry my daughter is going to have to go through me first. They're going to have to get my approval. Now, my daughter will have the liberty to choose out who she wants, but I am going to have the veto power. And that's it. I'm not going to tell her who to marry. I'm not going to say, you need to get married to this person. You need to get married to that person. I'm not going to appoint and arrange a marriage. That's just weird. And the Bible doesn't teach to do that. But there is an authority that the father has because the father has more wisdom because typically people get married a little bit younger before they've gained a lot of experience and knowledge through that experience. And a man is able to see things in other men that women can't see in other men. It's going to be a lot harder for a man to deceive her and me if it's some deadbeat or some loser that's not going to be able to take care of my daughter. 
Because the Bible does teach that the, the, the women are supposed to be dependent on, when they're at home, they're dependent on their father for, to provide for them. And when they get married, they're dependent on their husband to provide for them. So if my own daughter is going to go out and marry someone else and be dependent on them, I'm going to make sure that he's a good provider and that he's going to take care of her and love her. And that's the authority that the Bible, that God has given unto fathers. And would to God more fathers were invoking their responsibility and their authority to do such things. Now, obviously, this verse here, though, is talking about someone who's already gone off and been married, you know, and, and isn't under the, any longer under the direct authority of her father at home. She's gone off, she's got married, and he's saying, okay, you know what, now that your husband's dead, you're, you're no longer bound by the law of marriage, you're at liberty to be married to whom she will, only in the Lord. Verse 40, but she is happier if she so abide after my judgment, and I think also that I have the Spirit of God. He's saying, but you know what, if you're widowed, he's like, I th is he saying, I think it's better if you just remain unmarried and, you know, serve God without distraction. That's what he's saying. But by no means is that a commandment or anything like that. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the wisdom that you give us uh, regarding husbands and wives and virgins, dear Lord. We live in such a corrupt, backward society. God, I pray that you would please help us to reach people, especially the young people this generation, before they've committed the, the wicked sin of fornication, before they've, they've given their virginity to somebody who is not even going to be their spouse, dear Lord. I pray that you would please help us to reach the people and, and to get them to understand the importance of this, dear Lord, and the importance of their virgin, the importance of serving you with their life and the importance of, if you are married, staying married and staying together, dear Lord, and not having divorce be an option. God, I pray that you please help us to be a light in this dark, forsaken world that we can show others the right way and the good way in the old paths. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.